On 9-11, I was in New York City. Uh, you know, I grew up in New York City. I lived there my whole life. And so by 9-11, I had moved out to here for about, let's see, 9-11, about five, I was here for about five years. Mm -hmm. So the night before, on 9-10, the cast of Raymond flew into New York City. We were about to do a one-week uh, press junket because our show had just syndicated. So we were gonna do all the shows, the talk shows and the interviews and whatnot. So we all flew in on American Airlines on, on September 10th uh, with the cast, a couple of producers, a couple of assistants. Um, and we were in New York and actually on the night before from, I guess, Kennedy Airport, it might've been LaGuardia, I'm not sure. We drove over the 59th Street Bridge and uh, I remember, I believe it was Aaron Champion, who's Phil Rosenthal's assistant, had never been to New York. One of them, I forget, one of them, and we saw the Twin Towers from the 59th Street Bridge. We pointed them out because they had never been there. And there they were. Um, and then we went into the city and we went to our hotel. And then that night, we actually went to the Michael Jackson concert. I remember that. We saw Michael Jackson in Madison Square Garden. Um, and, and that was kind of surreal enough. Um, and that night, at midnight, Brad Garrett and I went to a pizza place on 6th Avenue. And then we went to our hotel on 59th Street. And the morning of 9-11, we were all scheduled to do little things. And, but all of us were gonna be at the Rosie O'Donnell show uh, but so that morning, Peter Boyle and I went and did. I uh, may be getting this some of these facts wrong, but so a new show, maybe Good Morning America or, or the Today Show. Peter Boyle and I got in the car and we went to the drove to the Rosie show. And as we were getting in the elevator, one of the PAs at the Rosie show was taking us up and said a, a plane had hit the World Trade Center. Did you hear? And, and we hadn't heard. And it was shocking enough, and I, I think someone said a small plane, whatever. We immediately thought it was pilot error or something, and it was tragic, but it was a mistake and an accident. And we got into the green room, and it was Peter and I there. We were waiting for the cast to come. We were there first, and we immediately turned the, the TV on, and there it was. The one of the towers was was burning and we still thought it might have been a small plane and the news people were speculating and whatnot and you know just a horrible accident and Peter was kind of off to the side and I was watching on live TV and I, I saw the second plane hit the tower yeah and I remember um, when the plane hit the tower I was kind of just computing things in my head. Nothing kind of made sense. And I remember the, exactly what I said, and it, it, it sounds a little contrived now, but the words, I don't even know if it was like subconscious, but I, when the plane went in and Peter was kind of off to the side, I just said, everything's different. And I, I didn't even know what that meant at that time, but you know, it kind of meant what it is. I mean, it was true, but it was, just this these words that came out of my mouth that everything's different um and then of course it, it became clear this was an attack and everything was you know the rosie show was canceled the cast never came and we went back from there we went back to the hotel to meet everybody so we went back to the hotel we stayed there in the green room and watched for a while peter and i i think my manager was with me rory was with me um and the show was canceled. We got into the hotel and I mean, we got into the car and went back to the hotel and we went back and I think it took a while. Some people, some of the cast members might have been out until we all had kind of been rounded up and were in our hotel rooms and we all were in one person's room. I don't remember exactly which person's room it was. 
and we were just watching on we had the TVs on we're watching and we were dumbfounded and we were calling I, my, my wife and kids were back home um, I, I say back home I mean New York was my home is my home they were back in LA yes they were back in LA um, so I you know everybody was calling up spouses and family members and waking them up they were on the west coast and and then we sat there and we watched the television and uh, until eventually the first tower fell and um, I remember thinking because people were frightened there was a couple girls that had never been to New York, a couple of the women who had never been to New York were upset and were breaking down a little and then the building fell and I, I think it was then when I started looking at the TV actually it's actually when the second you know, we then then it was just chaos and watching, and then the second building fell. And I remember sitting there, thinking, I almost had a panic attack because I was thinking this can't be real, this must be a dream, but I feel so awake, and that doesn't make sense. And I almost kind of freaked out there. I almost had a like a breakdown. I was my senses are, are lying to me. Uh, I'm awake, but this is happening. Um, and yeah, it was just disbelief. And, you know, it, it was just watching and listening. And then the rumors came that the, the uh, you know, the rumors that the Empire State Building or the George Washington Bridge was was loaded. And a little bit of panic slept into again to, to some of the people in there one of the young assistants actually broke down and started crying and we decided let's get out let's get out of the hotel room this is hours now later let's just let's just walk around and, 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 you know it'll be good for us just to walk around um you know for her sake at least you know and we went into central park and we just all we could think of was let's just walk through the park and and we walked, and um, there were people huddled around radios. It was a very weird sight. It almost looked like it was from, you know, the 1940s or whatever. Um, and everybody, no one kind of spoke. Strange. Everyone had a, a look on their face. And we were just walking and, you know, just trying to calm people down in our group. And... Again, this is hours later, and then we saw uh, a gentleman walking towards us who was just covered in soot from head to toe. He, he looked like a dust cloud, you know, with a briefcase in a suit and tie. He just barely make out a suit and tie, and his face was covered. And we just stopped him and said, what, where were you? And he said he was kind of like a, on the block or a block away when the building fell, and he got under a car. And he just got swallowed with the debris, the dust and the, the debris. And he just stayed there for a while till the settle and he couldn't really see. And he just told us a story of how he wasn't in the building. He didn't work in the building. He was just, I guess he worked in an adjoining building or whatever. And he was just caught there. And he didn't know what to do. He was, he lived in Staten Island. He obviously couldn't get over there. Everything, you know, all the crossways and the roadways were closed and his wife was in Staten Island and he was just walking aimlessly. He walked from, from downtown to 59th Street. And we happened to have an extra room. You know, we had a block of rooms for everybody, the whole contingency of the party. And there was one room that was empty and so we just said, Look, you know what, we got a room for you. You want to go and shower? And he was my size, he was my height and I had an extra pair of jeans. I gave him a pair of jeans and a t-shirt and he stayed with us. He stayed with us. We went out to eat that night to get something to eat and he stayed with us and we took in this guy who was, uh, you know, kind of at ground zero. Um, and the next morning, you know, that's it. He left. He part, we parted ways. But it was something at least, you know, uh, my whole thing is I, I, I'm a New Yorker and I lived there my whole life and then I moved to LA for my job and I was there and to come in the night before this to me uh, it's it's a 
odd coincidence, but it's, I, I felt, um, you know, there was more to it. I, I was, I was, I was happy to be in New York when this happened. Uh, it felt like, it's as if like a family member is hurt or in pain. And even if you can't do anything, you just want your presence there just so they, just to absorb it with them. Um, so it just felt right that, uh, that I was there. And my brother was a police officer who uh, retired about a year and a half before 9-11. So, I mean, thank God he's, or, or who knows if he's down there. And he went down, he volunteered the next day for the cleanup. Um, and, you know, there are a couple people I, that, I lost, that I knew that uh, lost their life there. Can I, I can mention them? Yeah. Um, there's a, a family that I grew up with, uh, the Hoffmans, and I grew up in Forest Hills, Queens, and they had 12 kids in their family. Uh, so I was friends with a lot of them, and I was clo closer friends with the guy my age, and, and he had twin brothers, Stephen and Greg, and Stephen worked for um, Cannon Fitzgerald, and he lost his life. Uh, and there were the girl I grew up with across the street from me. She married a fireman, Bobby King, and he lost his life. So um, it was very, uh, I mean, it was personal for everybody, but it just, uh, yeah, just, it happened in a place that I love and where my family is, yeah. After a couple days, you know, we couldn't get home the next day. And I think it was the, Second day after, they arranged to fly us back home on a Citation 10, I guess, a small plane, and they would have to stop off in Denver and whatnot. And Brad Garrett and I were kind of uh, a little bit uh, creeped out about the whole idea of flying again, even. And we decided, why wait till the next day? I think the plane was. No, I think we left on the same day. Actually, I said, "Why not? Let's just let's just drive home." And we, and he had two cousins with him that were in town also. So we said, "Why don't we just get a driver to take us?" And then we thought, of, "Why not just get a bus, like a rock star bus or something?" Um, you know, I mean, not a bus. You know, not, you know, not a, a school bus, but like a bus where with a with a bathroom and a couch and whatnot. Not and, a Partridge Family yeah, bus. Yeah, and a TV, and we got on a bus. And, you know, made some phone calls, and they found a uh, a pretty cool bus. And there were two drivers there, and we started driving home. And another, you know, one of the, there were many surreal moments, but one of them was driving, I think we were on the, uh, before we, we went through Brooklyn, I think. So we were going into the Brooklyn Tunnel, and we were past you know, where the World Trans was, this is two days later, day and later, and smoke still coming up, you know. And we were heading out, and um, we thought, okay, this is good, well, let's, let's go home, you know, our families are home, they're kind of, uh, everyone's kind of out of sorts, you know. My kids were little, my, my daughter was about, hmm, she was eight, no, she was nine then, ten, ten. Um, um, and I had twin boys who were eight, seven and I said, let's get home to them. And we started driving and it was kind of, okay, this is a good move until you, you reach Pennsylvania, maybe. <laughs> and then we went through Tennessee. We got to Tennessee and I was looking on the map and I'm like, Tennessee is still like here and our home is here. And we stopped at a hotel and we decided, let's just drive. Let's just get in a car and drive. Because the bus was this driver, that driver, we have to stop. And it was big and we didn't know where to, it was like empty with a couch. And let, let's get in our own car and drive. And we rented a car and we said goodbye to the bus drivers. And we started driving through Tennessee. I don't know if you ever drove to Tennessee, but it's, you start here. By the time you're halfway through, you've spent the whole day almost. We got to the end of Tennessee, it was like nine hours later, whatever, eight hours later, 
So this is never going to work. And we said, let's just see. By the next day, the airwaves are open and it's easy. And, and we were actually talking to Patty. We were calling them. They, they said, we're in Denver now. We're on our way home. You know, we were kind of regretting the decision we made. But um, we stopped at a casino in Mississippi. You know, we were where, I think it was where Mississippi, Arkansas, and Tennessee all kind of intersect. And we stopped at a casino in Mississippi and spent the night. And the next day, we chartered a plane from uh, Arkansas, from Little Rock, Arkansas. Um, and we, uh, we got home from there. We got home that following day, a day after everybody else got home. But I won $100 in Mississippi, so it was a crazy experience, you know. Amazing. And um, I got home, and um, I took my kids to church, I think, the next day. And it was really, you know, because when you're there, you're kind of in, in the, you're wrapped up in everything that's going on in the moment. And it's when you step back a little, where things, things hit you. And it was, it was at church there when, uh, before the church ended, they all sang God Bless America. And it, yeah, it just all kind of came piling down on me. And I, and, and it was, you know, as corny as those words were, everything is different. It just felt, it felt that way. Yeah. It felt like everything was different. It felt like, you know, it felt like, um, when you, uh, if you're ever like, or if you have a friend or somebody who's been the victim of something, of a, a, a carjack or a car robbery or, or violence, they're always a little overprotective, looking over the shoulder. It just felt like that. It felt like the nation had been uh, a victim of this crime and just would kind of be a little looking over their shoulder, yeah. you know, for as long as they needed to, yeah. Yeah, well, we were debating whether to go. We were the following um, Friday, I believe, was when we were going to film in front of the live audience. And, you know, it seems like a cliche to say, hey, we, you know, the, the nation needs to something to, to, to help a, to a release of some kind. But it, but it was true. You know, the talk show guys did it the best. I mean, they got out there and, and they, they spoke what they felt, you know, and everybody, you know, felt, you know, they united kind of everybody with, with their sentiment about the, the event and, and the emotion. And then that, that allowed them then to, okay, let's, let's move on with our life because we have to and because, you know, we we need to uh, live and, and not let this defeat us, you know? And laughter, it is, you know, in times of tragedy, sometimes it is a great release. Um, you know, it, it, the audience was very res receptive that night. They, they, they kind of, as, as a whole, they just, wanted to you know it was a, it was it was this f sense of a community you know they were laughing as a whole you know together um and nobody was feeling like uh it was out of place they were feeling you know there's there's going to be a lot of thinking a lot of sorrow and a lot of hurt and a lot of pain so let's for this moment uh try to tr try to release some of some of this you know and, and and get some strength back uh it wasn't a matter of choosing whether to incorporate our and for, for us that decision never had to come up because we don't our show wasn't about that anyway we we were never topical or, or we it was our show you know we tried to be timeless and and just be about the, the American family, yeah. So that wasn't a decision for us. That was more of a decision for the talk show guys and the Saturday Night Live guys. Um, you know, the uh, yeah, we we didn't even have to consider that. Our thought was, uh, can we can we do a show next week? You know, is the audience ready to do a show? Are they do they want to laugh? And 
you know, I think we were, I think it was, it was a good decision to get out there and just bring some relief to the people, you know? I agree. Yeah. I agree. Was it hard for you guys to go out and do that? Yeah, it was, you know, you had, you had, we addressed it. I, I came out and talked before every show. I just said hello to the audience. So I went out there and we shared our experience with them a little, you know, we told them what we went through and, and, um, it was a traumatic experience for all, for all of us, really. Um, and to be there also, um, you know, it, it, it kind of, uh, it was good that we shared it together, you know. Um, and then we went back in November and we actually took a tour of the ground zero there. There were a couple uh, officers, police officers who took us around and that was uh, also very um, inspiring uh, to see these guys, you know, for the cleanup. And I remember specifically one sergeant and I forgot his name, but I remember um, asking him, he took us to this site and that site and what they were doing. And there was a memorial that we, we signed. And I remember asking him, I said, um, because they, they, they were finding out whether or not this was a da dangerous, there, whether there were toxins and whether this, these guys were gonna be exposed to something. And I asked him about it. I said, what do you feel? Are, are you worried? And he said, um, you know, my, I have a kid, he's eight years old. Uh, if something happens because of what I'm doing here, I figure it'll be down the road. It'll be more than 10 years away. He said, as long as I see those years of my child's life, somebody has to do this here. Yeah. And I just, yeah, I just, just blown away by the, you know, that courage and that, uh, yeah, that's just, you just, you can't believe, you're, you're just grateful for for guys like that. I mean, you wish they, they never had to make that decision, but you just are in awe of them. It's, yeah, I mean, it's, like I say, I, 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 I'm very grateful that I was there. I would hate to have been here and just watch my hometown have to go through this. And I wish I could have done more. There wasn't really anything I could do except just be there um you know i had so many connections to it my brother was a cop my friend that died there uh, I, I worked in this city i drove a futon truck oh i've been in the all around and in the world trade center my wife worked across the street not at the time but one time uh, i did comedy in the plaza of the world trade center outdoors yeah, when I was doing stand-up and just getting up wherever I, they would put you up, they had a, once a week, they had a little comedy thing outdoors on a platform. Yeah, it wasn't the best uh, setup for a comedian, but I mean, they are in between the... the yeah, I, have a, I have this picture of my daughter, uh, and I believe it's at the Empire State Building Observatory, and in the background is the World Trade Center, and that's on my desk now. Um, because it, it's such a weird juxtaposition of you know, the innocence, her innocence, and this image of of something that you know this atrocity that happened. But um, yeah, but I'm you know it's it's good to remember all the people that died and the people that worked so hard to get us back on our feet. And I remember Stewart, John Stewart, and his monologue about seeing the Statue of Liberty now. Like he used to, from his window, he used to see these twin towers and they took it down and now he sees the Statue of Liberty. And yeah, I mean, those guys had a had a tough job um, getting out there. And Letterman, of course, was very eloquent, I know. And Leno, they, they all, they all, they all did what they, but I think it was good. I think they had to do it. I think cutting, stopping, shutting down and all, uh, wouldn't have done any good for us, you know? Yeah. You, know you always use humor as, as your release, as your defense. And, you know, that night when we went to dinner with this new friend that we found, he actually, you know, because Brad's there and we're there and we're trying to 
and again the 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 assistants and the PAs are there and everybody's away from home and they're all uh, they're, they're filled with anxiety anyway so we are trying to to make it easier for them and try to get them to smile and chuckle and Brad is very good at that Brad Garrett so it's good to have Brad Garrett there and then the gentleman that we were helping actually had one of the best lines and he said you know people are gonna believe that um, I was at the World Trade Center but no one's gonna believe that I had dinner with the cast of Raymond yeah very funny. funny. I hate to be to say anything light because I don't want to seem disrespectful. It's the same at a, uh, like like you mentioned a funeral. Those are sometimes the, the 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 where they laugh the most because they're all in this mood and they're just on they're just it's all bottled and when you tell all you need is a, a small crack and it just comes flooding out you know the the laughter yeah. Um, and yeah, that was kind of similar to after after uh, 9-11. I mean, I guess SNL was right after that. And, and Rudy Giuliani was on and Lauren Michaels says, do you think it's okay to be funny? And Rudy Giuliani said, well, why start now? And yeah, so there was the mayor of New York who's saying, let's, let's get together and laugh. And, and, and feel good after feeling all this pain. You know?